some information about this earthquake um, and show some of the damage to it and point out some of the more interesting aspects that it occurred. For those of you who are not aware of it, New Zealand uh, is essentially over the boundary of the Australian plate and the Pacific plate and along these um, blue lines here is major subduction, uh, primarily subduction. And you can see the, the rates of movement are in the order of 40 to 50 millimeters per year. And in addition to the, to the major subduction areas, there are a large number of transversal faults. Uh, the place where the earthquake, this is Christchurch here, and you can see that there's not really apparently anything much of the way of transversal faults which would have strike-slip characteristics there, but quite a lot in the general region here. Now, if we... Hmm, hello, Ryan. Yeah, okay, here we are. If we look at the, the historical aspects of, of um, major earthquakes in the region, over the last 150 years, you can see all of these sites here of magnitude 7 plus earthquakes. So it is a very seismically active region. But you can also see that in Christchurch here, just right at the base here, there's not really been any major activity close by. There was a feeling, uh, an awareness that there could be additional earthquakes on the transversal faults at a distance of approximately 100 kilometers from Christchurch, and also the major alpine fault going right through there, the subduction zone here, is anticipated to be able to generate a magnitude 8 plus earthquake at a distance again of maybe 100 to 120 kilometers, but which would cause a very significant shaking in Christchurch. So in fact, the, the design seismicity for Christchurch was based primarily on the Alpine Fault, but uh, about 85% of the uniform risk spectrum came from that, and about 15% from localised um, faults some distance away from Christchurch. Looking at this in a bit more detail, to give you some idea, perhaps I'll just go back briefly. What we have here is mountains down this range here. Uh, we have volcanic area here that uh, is extinct. It uh, has created some big reasonable sized hills and volcanoes that are about 8 million years old and between those there is an alluvial plain. This uh, seismic area, sorry, this um, um, volcanic area used to be islands but the distance between them and these alpine fault has been filled in by um, by alluvium over the years. So there's looking at uh, the location of Christchurch itself, this what's called Banks Peninsula, which is solid rock, and then up in this region here, the Alpine area, and Darfield, which is the closest significant town to the fault itself. In fact, it's not a fault itself, it's a very complex earthquake involving movement on four faults. So I think uh, to give some generalized uh, characteristics of it, the magnitude 7.1, epicentral depth uh, 11 kilometers, 37 kilometers from Christchurch, but the closest part of the fault rupture was about 15 kilometers. Mechanism basically strike slip involving four different sources. In fact, it started off with one fault, which was a blind thrust fault moving for about two seconds. This triggered a strike slip on another fault, which went for about 15 seconds, and that triggered two more faults on two additional blind thrust faults. So extremely complex, but these were all continuous, going from one to the other. And we ended up with a, a, a length of shaking of approximately 25 seconds. So it's very complex. The ground conditions in Christchurch, generally deep alluvium, um, though it tapers off when you get towards that volcanic area, and there was some reflection of the earthquake motion from that. There was some uh, focusing of the, um, of the activity towards Christchurch because this, the epicenter was some distance away and then moved towards Christchurch itself. So there was some focusing associated with that. 
A fair amount of uh, fine silts associated with rivers, so liquefaction potential, and you'll see a fair amount of that. Um, aftershocks, magnitude uh, about 5.6 maximum, uh, many of them under Christchurch, and many of them associated with the blind thrust faults, uh, not so much the, the slip uh, strike. Big earthquake with significant damage, uh, loss of life, none. So it was extraordinarily fortunate. It happened early in the morning. Uh, everyone was in bed, 4.30 in the morning. A couple of people were injured, a lot of miraculous escapes. But about $5 billion worth of damage in an area which had a population of approximately uh, 400,000 people. So quite significant. That works out that more than $12,000 per inhabitant of the affected area. And that's a significant level of damage, but when you consider that there was no loss of life, we were extremely fortunate. This gives some idea of the, the main shock. You can see this uh, blue arrow, this blue star points towards a blue dot here, which is the epicentral. That's the start of it, the, the epicentral region. Then this is the major fault, that the strike slip fault here, that uh, triggered this additional blind thrust fault and this one over here. Uh, and then there's, no, sorry, one of the blind thrust faults is in this region here. But you can certainly see some activity along there, activity along here, a bit of a concentration in this region and more. A lot of the aftershocks were much closer to Christchurch and the center of Christchurch than the major earthquake itself. So some of the response uh, in the aftershocks in the central city area felt worse than the actual earthquake itself. It just shows some distribution of the, of the epicenters of the main earthquake and of the major um, earthquakes or, or aftershocks itself. Damage, as I said, was uh, relatively significant. More than 3,000 houses damaged by, beyond repair. Uh, in terms of partial damage, the most common thing was damage to chimneys, and 26,000 houses uh, lost their chimneys, often through the roof, so causing more damage to the houses. Extensive damage to unreinforced masonry. A lot of the central business district of Christchurch uh, was built in the 1870s to 1910 before seismic design. A lot of them very attractive um, Victorian or Edwardian buildings, uh, but many of them badly damaged. Extensive damage to buildings that had not been retrofitted, but pretty good behavior of those that had. Modern buildings, mainly less than 10 stories uh, high, a few taller than that, but not much. Uh, mainly glazed, uh, uh, non-structural details were damaged. Um, bridges, a lot of abutment slumping, slumping. And as you'll see from the slides, uh, extensive damage to soils, particularly liquefaction and lateral spreading, and particularly near existing or previous rivers. Seismological details felt throughout New Zealand. Local intensity up to MM9. Uh, strong ground motion was extremely well covered by more than 100 seismographs, uh, seismometers. So we've got very good uh, data about the response itself. At the, uh, near the epicenter, the maximum uh, acceleration of about 1.3 G. Uh, and many records with peak ground acceleration greater than 0.5 G. Design peak ground acceleration for the region was essentially 0.22 G. So the seismologist got it a little wrong there. And the ruptures occurred on a previously unknown fault, the major fault being the Greendale fault, but the other three faults involved in it also had not been recognized. So just emphasizing again something which McKelly has mentioned, that, uh, that we have to be a little bit careful about the predictions of seismolo uh, seismologists about the seismicity of a particular area because often we just don't have the information on which to base it. This just shows, it's a bit difficult to see, but this shows the distribution of seismometers in the general region. Since the earthquake, there's been a lot of activity going on in seeing whether the response was uh, similar to what would be predicted. And this shows in the Christchurch district traces from four earthquake records compared with what the predicted ground motion would be given the actual earthquake activity that occurred. Uh, and you can see that this is the mean value here, 
and the average value that occurred uh, was uh, rather higher from about uh, 0.2 of a second onwards and there appears to be a little bit of a bulge here at about two and a half seconds. I say a little bit of a bulge with a quote on it because we'll see in a few minutes just what that bulge really looks like because of course seismologists don't like to use natural um, uh, graphs, they like to use um, log graphs because it makes the errors look so much smaller. And the same thing here when it's compared with the design spectra here in log scale, both log period and log acceleration, you can see that this is the design spectra in the blue line, this is earthquake records, and it looks as though the design spectra is very conservative, but that's in the 0.1 second period range up to uh, 0.2 second period range. It's still reasonably conservative here, but again you can see a bit of a bulge where it's been non-conservative. All right, that's, that's showing the, the data in the way engineer, uh, sorry, seismologists like to see it. But this is what it looks like when we put it into natural scale, like engineers like to see it itself. So the design spectrum is shown here, this red line here. And these are the earthquake records of four different, er four different records taken in the central business district of Christchurch itself. You can see that the, uh, the average, which is the brown line here, is pretty severe actually in the short period range. Um, it's not bad up to about one second. And then in this region here, it really gets to be extremely uh, poor in terms of predicting the acceleration response spectrum. And that's what it looks like in terms of the displacement spectra itself. And look at that then. We see some of these earthquake records here with maximum response uh, displacements at about 2.7 seconds of more than a metre and that's in the centre of Christchurch. And the average of the ones here is still more than twice the design level at more than 500 millimetres itself. So we have some real concerns, of course, about how the design spectra compared with the response. Now, fortunately, there were not many structures or no structures really in this period range here. Most of the elastic periods were in the uh, well, say one second to two second region where the response was reasonably well predicted and uh, not too over designed and also the designs themselves were very conservative in terms of the fact that they had been well designed by force based uh, procedures but often gra gravity design uh, dominated and the actual lateral strength we believe was a couple of times or maybe even more times the, uh, the design required strength. Well, let's look at some of the, the damage uh, to different types of structures. Damage to houses, as I mentioned, was the most common. Uh, and this shows not a typical example at all, but this is a, a, a rather famous old building, an old house in Christchurch, one of the early settlers' houses built in about the 1860s, very close to the epicentral region. And you can see that it's a complete write-off, very bad damage. Another view taken from the back from the ear and the structure is almost completely uh, collapsed. The more common damage looked like this where chimneys uh, have collapsed and fallen into the house and clearly caused damage to the roof and often to the floors below it. And a large number of houses had damage similar to that. You can see this is the sort of of uh, chimney that tended to exist, often very tall, uh, and you can see this one is perilously close to a failure, failed. And where there are brick gables, this very commonly, the peak of the gable uh, was uh, fell off itself. So a very com common sort of damage. We'll see other sorts of damages to more modern houses, primarily related to soils effects later on in this presentation. When we look at damage to building, um, particularly unreinforced masonry, uh, glazing, and non-structural elements uh, are what we see from this itself. Um, this just shows uh, a slide of the central, or part of the central business district, and the colored, the brown or the red colored regions show buildings that were badly damaged. The red ones were ones which were 
uh, so badly damaged that no access was permitted to them. Uh, many of these have been since have been uh, demolished, most of them unreinforced masonry, and the, the orange ones were limited access, so part of the buildings were damaged, uh, they were not allowed to be used for, um, for business purposes, but some access could be allowed to go into them to, to get materials and stuff out of them. Um, as I said, many of these buildings have since been demolished or are still being demolished, and uh, the, the disruption to the use of the central business district still continues to this day. Like this road here, Manchester Street, is still partly blocked off, and you can see that that was one of the most seriously affected areas. Just typical signs, uh, this is just photographed from a, from a book, which is why it looks rather strange through the, through the middle of it, but um, we've got too much light on it from elsewhere. Uh, but it's a typical scene taken just a few hours after the earthquake as the, the sun came up. It's not possible to get some of these audium, uh, auditorium lights down a bit because the slides will be much easier to see. If it's simple. We'll see. Anyway, we'll carry on uh, until... Yeah. Oh, don't worry if it's a... If it's a <laughs> I'll go ahead anyway, if they get it done well and good. Uh, it, it looks quite... Imp uh, yeah, that is, that's much better, thanks. Much better, I think you'll all see a lot. No, no, leave them off. That's a <laughs> okay, that's a typical scene just a few hours after the earthquake on Manchester Street, that street that's still blocked off. Other ones, just the same first morning after the earthquake. This sort of damage, you can imagine, there's a lot of cars in this situation in the central business district. You can imagine what would have been the case if it had occurred during working hours. There would have been a large number of fatalities. Impossible to estimate how many, but it, uh, it could have been as high as 100. This is a very common form of damage. You can see the separation of the gable and almost collapse of this uh, you know, fairly ornate unreinforced masonry building where the gable has not been secured. Uh, masonry walls that have collapsed out of the side of a, a fairly straightforward building. Again, a similar example here, double wide concrete. The, yeah, a very attractive toilet now. <laughs> Yeah. And, and so forth. There are many examples of, these, of this type of damage throughout Christchurch. Just, uh, again, the unreinforced masonry normally failing under face load. For design buildings, uh, the damage was most commonly of glazing itself. You can see here a number of the, uh, the windows have blown out or been blown out by the displacements of the, of the relative displacements of the floor. And this occurred to a large number of buildings, despite the fact that the New Zealand Design Code has a requirement that the, the glazing must be designed for at least a relative drift of 1%. And this is a fairly modern building that would have been designed to that level. So there were certainly some fairly large structural um, displacements and drifts. Um, a lot of secured masonry buildings performed extremely well with very little damage, as you can say, in this rather ornate value here. Churches, a large number of churches were damaged, a lot of them are of brick or of block, and you can see again this characteristic loss of the gable, which has not been secured properly to the uh, roof structure, which would have prevented this sort of damage. Uh, another church very close to the epicenter, you can see the bell tower has fallen off and gone through the roof of the church itself. Uh, just, I was there just a, a week ago and uh, the roof has been completely repaired and they were working on, on fixing up this. So a lot of progress made in some areas at least. Another church itself and very close to collapse of, of this lintel area here. Reinforced, now this is uh, pre-1970 buildings. In New Zealand, uh, the, 
the seismic design codes changed dramatically in 1976 uh, with a code that we believe is pretty good you know, as far as a force-based code can be. Um, and most, pretty much all structures designed after that, with one exception I'll show in two slides time, perform very well. But you can see that this structure here, it is reinforced concrete. Um, you can see that we've had major shear failure of these spandrels here, and also it's not so easy to see, but these spandrels here in these, or these walls, sorry, not spandrels, here and here have failed uh, in that region. And you can see that they are the stiffest elements of the structure in the, longer, in the transverse direction. You note that there is no damage to these more slender piers here. So they've coped with the displacement perfectly well. These ones have not. This structure is uh, being repaired. Uh, it's quite attractive inside. Uh, it's a lot of Art Deco work in it, and uh, it's fortunate this is being re repaired. Now, in the Christchurch Hospital, the main Christchurch Hospital, the parking building uh, had been designed, I think, in the 1960s and was assessed some stage later, I don't know in what year, and found to be unsafe. And as a consequence, they built in some, uh, some eccentrically braced frames here. You can see that there is a panel here between them. This is a detail here, so that under transverse response here, there is inelastic response expected of the bracing in this region here. And in fact, it's, it's impossible to see it in this slide, really. But you may see some sort of roughness or some light colored material there. And that is actually the paintwork spalling off because these shear panels did do what they were expected and intended to do. They went into the inelastic range and reduced the, uh, the response. Now you can see that they were put there because these columns here were considered to be unsafe. And uh, they were right. <laughs> there's, there's one of the bracing bits in the background there. And you can see that this quite slender column has had a shear failure in it. And is now, I guess they didn't put as much bracing in as perhaps they might have. And in fact, it was a little bit torsionally uh, located so that at this region here, you would predict that the largest displacements occurred at this location. So very little transverse reinforcement in these typical piers and several failures of them. Uh, for those of you who know, that's Stefano Pampanin there and uh, a failed column. And uh, many of the slides that I've got here comes from Stefano, so I'm grateful to him. Now this is quite an interesting structure here. It's unusual looking at it uh, physically, but what it is is a, a, it has a structural shear, structural wall core in it and then it has gravity frames around the outside with uh, these rather interesting shaped beams and then floor slabs going from the beams through to the internal core. So these are non-structural, these uh, frames on the outside, and they're deliberately designed with a pin connection, uh, as you can see here, the, the structure comes into a point there, and so this is not intended to participate in the response at all. And that would look very nice in the models that the structural engineer made for this. Unfortunately, he forgot to tell the building that really it was meant to do that. And as a consequence, what we find is that though the structure itself performed very well, if we look in detail at the columns in this region itself, you can see some damage. You can see some spalling of the columns here and here and here associated with the corner. And in a bit more detail there, you can see it quite clearly. And when you look at it, it doesn't look as though that's a perfect pin. After all, these columns are continuous. It's not as though there's no reinforcement going through there. And there is a significant moment resistance and some joint shear in these regions. So a fair amount of largely cosmetic damage here of this non-structural element or supposedly non-structural element. This is just another column showing the same thing. Uh, where we have some joint damage and spalling of the, the, the reinforcement on the side where the column will be in tension. So uh, a fair amount of, of remedial work required to this rather attractive building. And again, something that we all know is that uh, non-structural details do need to be detailed as carefully as structural ones or the damage can be very considerable. <coughs> 
Christchurch Women's Hospital. This is a new uh, uh, hospital just built in the last 10 years, which is uh, on seismic isolation units itself. Um, and this is the, there are both sliders under some of the columns and elastomeric bearings with steel uh, plates under others. And you can see there that there is some, well, there is some relative displacement of the sliders and some relative displacements. This is the residual displacement we're talking about here of the bearings itself. So it worked very well. No damage in the building itself, but you can see uh, indications of significant damage of the, the base of the structure above the isolators and the outside region of the structure. You can see these relative displacements. So that performed extremely well. Now this is one of the, the sad but uh, sad stories of the, of the earthquake. This is a, a rather beautiful old building uh, built in 1906, um, an early Edwardian building with rather attractive details. And you can't see them, I'll show a, a, another view of it. This is actually after the earthquake. And there is some damage to these piers here some sheer cracking, maximum width probably about 10 millimeters, and it was decided that this building was too severely damaged and had to be, uh, had to be demolished. And uh, a number of us tried to fight that, but uh, the owner didn't have the insurance. His insurance would not have paid for the upgrading and repair, and so he knocked it down and was going to build a very ugly modern building. And, uh, well, it's just one of the sad stories of it. Contents, of course, large number of, of, uh, of problems with that. And this represents damage to the library shelving in the University of, Can of Canterbury. And, of course, we, I tend to think of University of Canterbury as one of the key structural research facilities in earthquake engineering. And it's a bit distressing to see that they didn't manage to persuade the, the library building to secure its, uh, its uh, shelves. And this, this library is a total disaster in terms of non-structural damage. Uh, this is typical of what happens in uh, supermarkets um, and in storage areas, a lot of damage of that sort of aspect as well. Yeah, yes, it's very sad that left hand one in particular. <laughs> Now, geotechnical aspects were particularly interesting in this. The most extensive damage has resulted from soil's effects. Large amounts of liquefaction affecting housing in particular, lateral spreading uh, affecting housing and roads, and dislocation of underground services. Uh, and this will take years to rectify. Uh, so there's, there's major problems with that. Just to, to show the surface faulting, you can see here, this was a continuous line of trees. Uh, they're now displaced by about four and a half meters in this region. So very substantial surface expression of the strike slip fault here. Um, you can see the surface faulting is uh, not inconsiderable. <laughs> I was hoping that there's no aftershock when that happens. Uh, typical slumping of, the, uh, of roads close to rivers, as you can see here, lateral spreading. Um, you can see in this aerial photograph here at the bottom, there's um, a river here, it's the River Avon, and you can see the lateral spreading that has occurred as this material here has spread into the river itself. Uh, typical roads, problems to roads with lateral spreadings. Uh, sand boils and sand volcanoes very extensively throughout. This is just one rather typical example, but quite, quite significant ones. An interesting thing here, this was a buried pipeline uh, and uh, the earthquake with the liquefaction and the air inside it, it floated up. So it actually is expressed on the above ground now. Uh, railway lines, um, New Zealand railway lines are normally a little straighter than this, but not too much, but uh, <laughs> it's not too good. <laughs> uh, this is also a case of flotation. This is the, the gas tank, the storage tank for petrol at a gas station and rather empty liquefaction in the area and the, the, the tank didn't sink, it floated and came up. Uh, damage to houses due to soil's effect were very considerable and you can see this is a modern house, very badly damaged, uh, very significant uh, drifts of the house itself. This fellow here's house is a 
not quite as uh, good as he as it used to be. In many cases, the lateral spreading going right through the house and sort of tearing it apart. Uh, this is uh, one of the members of parliament for the area, not his house, but uh, damage to roading. This is, it appears to be from a compression wave going through, and buckling the the, re the, the, the macadam of the of the road. Several footbridges uh, failed in this sort of fashion. Here, where the <coughs> this was a very simple suspension bridge, but the anchorage for the suspension failed due to slumping of the the anchorage, and hence the whole bridge just imploded and collapsed in this fashion, as shown here. Just another view of that bridge. A lot of typical, sorry, uh, abutment slumping such as occurs in pretty much every earthquake, um, shown there and with another bridge there. Another view of uh, a fairly significant uh, rail deformation in, in a different location from the last one. I don't know what he's lost down there, but he looks like he's worried by it. But again, this is slumping associated with a, a river here in the road, just splitting and spreading very substantially. So to summarize, to look at the success stories, <coughs> well, first, there was no loss of life. There was no failure of major design buildings, which I think um, is a pretty good justification and, and uh, expression of the New Zealand seismic design codes, particularly since 1976. Retrofitted, unreinforced masonry buildings performed well, and normally the retrofitting was just tying the structures to the floors and to the, the roofs, sometimes adding some vertical pre-stressing and so forth. Power restoration was very rapid, 90% in 24 hours uh, back. Telecommunications also restored very rapidly. Water and wastewater uh, repairs are going to be much slower and will take some years before that's done. Another ins at least partial success story is insurance. In New Zealand, if you buy insurance for fire for your house, then you automatically have to buy insurance for earthquake. It's just an added effect that you have no choice with. That money goes to the government and the Earthquake Commission, EQC, buys reinsurance with that money each year. So they go with a certain amount, typically 50% of the money they get from the insurance. They go around to the big reinsurance companies like Munich Ray and Swiss Ray and get the best deal they can to reinforce it. So they maybe put a billion dollars in and get $20 billion worth of insurance. And so in this case, they have a deductible of 1.5 billion, which is what the New Zealand government will pay. The rest of the 5 billion will be paid by the Swiss and the Germans, which is nice. <laughs> there have been about 140,000 insurance claims, and that's in a population of 400,000 people, which pretty much means that every property has put in at least one insurance claim. I did. <laughs> I put in one. <laughs> So at least 70% of the houses in the affected area have put in insurance claims. Many of these are minor, like uh, hot water cylinders have broken and moved around, things of that sort of nature. And some of them are opportunistic, meaning that the damage was there before the earthquake, but people have said, well, let's put in a claim for it and see if they're stupid enough to do it. But um, repair is slow, partly because with such a huge number of claims, each of them has to be assessed before they can actually be, uh, be activated. Uh, no temporary accommodation has been constructed and there have been some problems associated with that and McKelly will tell a success story out of a very different nature with the Lakula earthquake tomorrow. And finally, another success story, there are lots of new playgrounds around for children. <laughs> so, so, thank you very much. That's it. Uh,